Income Tax 2023-2024, accounting for your income. Get ready and some coffee so that you don't find income tax preparation too taxing. Most of this information can be found in Publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement, most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income, noting that the sole proprietorship Schedule C rolls into line one income of the formula, which is funny because the Schedule C is in and of itself a form of income statement having business income minus business expenses, otherwise known as business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income rolling into line one income of the formula, which basically mirrors the first page of the form 1040, which we can see here, net income ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from schedule one. Here is a schedule one, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, additional income schedule c rolling into line three business income from the schedule c here is a schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement format income minus expenses all right so now we want to think about accounting for income remembering the general rule from the irs is that first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions if you would like a commercial free experience consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com everything basically is income unless the irs basically says otherwise but the second question we have to ask is if it is income where should it be recorded we've touched on this a few times in prior presentations but it is of course a crucial question because it makes a difference to the income taxes as to where it's going to be reported. If it was W-2 income, it would be reported on page one of the form 1040, and it would be subject to self to payroll taxes, which would be deducted on the W-2, but only the employee portion. If it was sole proprietorship income, it has to be reported on the Schedule C, in which case you do get the deductions, which is great, but you're subject to the self-employment tax, both employee and employer portion on the net income. So that's going to make a big difference. And there's questions in terms of some income having more preferable tax rates, most income being taxed at ordinary income tax rates, some such as the qualified dividends, possibly long-term capital gains having more favorable tax rates. All right. So accounting for your income for income tax purposes differs at times from accounting for financial purposes. This section discusses some of the more common differences that may affect business transactions. So figure your business income on the basis of a tax year and account and according to your regular method of accounting. So we talked about this before when we focused in on the accounting period, which for taxes usually is a calendar year, but you can think of having a different kind of year for a fiscal year. And then the accounting method that would be used normally for taxes other than the Schedule C, like reporting deductions for a Schedule A, we use a cash-based method for the most part until the IRS tells us when we can't use a cash-based method. On the Schedule C, we could elect possibly a cash-based method, but we might be forced to have an accrual method in some cases, such as if there is inventory, and we might just choose to have an, an accrual method, in which case we have a different revenue recognition method 
for income on the Schedule C than we do possibly when we're looking at income elsewhere, which is typically on a cash-based method. So if the sale of a product is an income producing factor in your business, you usually have to use inventories to clearly show your income. Dealers in real estate are not allowed to use uh, inventories. For more information on inventories, you can see chapter two. So we talked about the concept of inventory and how it might tell us or force us to push from a cash-based method to an accrual-based method. When you think about real estate, uh, thinking about selling actual you know, physical property, real estate, then uh, that could also complicate how you would think of uh, an inventory situation. In other words, some things can either be inventory or non-inventory depending on the how they are used. If I have a forklift and I'm using it in the business to move stuff around, it would generally be reported as property planted equipment, you would think the cost of it being allocated over the useful life. But if I buy and sell forklifts, then the forklifts are basically inventory, in which case I would expense it when I sell them, you would think, in terms of cost of goods sold. But real estate can get a little bit messy because of the size and the type of industry that real estate is in when you're buying and selling inventory that are basically homes. So that can be kind of a specialty, another kind of specialty uh, type of area. So income paid to a third party. So all income you earn is taxable to you. You cannot avoid tax by having the income paid to a third party. We discussed this a little bit when we talked about the income side of things on a cash versus an accrual method. You might think, especially if you're on a cash method, that income should only be recorded when it increases my checking account. And that's the general rule but obviously, the, the IRS is going to be skeptical and put exceptions in there if we try to do things just to avoid taxes, such as having income go to a third party, basically our agent or something like that. It went into my friend's bank account, and then they gave it to me in the following year or at some future time. Well, you should still be recording the income when you had the cash available would be the general idea. So example. So you rent out your property and the rental agreement directs the leasee to pay the rent uh, to your son. So now it's your property, but the money is not going to you. It's going to your son. So obviously that would be the similar situation as the money going to you and then you paying your son so he can go whatever, do whatever, do whatever he does. I don't even want to know. So the amount paid to your son is gross income to you. So clearly that would generally be the case. So cash discounts. So these are amounts the seller permits you to deduct from invoice price for prompt payment. For income tax purposes, you can use either of the following two methods to account for cash discounts. So deduct the cash discount from purchases. See line 36, purchase uh, less cost of items withdrawn for personal use in chapter six, credit the cash discount to the discount income account. So in other words, now you're, you're purchasing something and you get a discount, a cash discount on it, possibly because you paid cash. So oftentimes when you're buying inventory, then they might, in order to pay them sooner, for them to get their money sooner, they might give you a discount. Well, if you're buying inventory, you would think that the, the discount that you're going to be receiving, you could reflect it in the cost of the inventory that you're purchasing, basically lowering the cost of the inventory, in which case when you sell the inventory, it will be reflected uh, in the cost of goods sold because you'll have a lower amount of cost of goods sold and a greater sales price resulting in more income, which would result in more taxes. Or you could say, well, I'm just going to keep the possibly keep the inventory at the normal cost uh, because I may or may not always take the discount and then just credit the cash discount to the discount income account. Meaning when they give me the discount, I'm not going to mess up my flow assumptions for inventory, but rather just record it as income when I get the discount, which would be fine from the IRS's perspective because you would be recording income when you get the discount, possibly sooner in that case, and therefore paying the taxes uh, for that income. So you must use uh, the chosen method every year for all your purchase discounts. So consistency is going to be the principal concept here because 
consistency is just a general rule concept and because if they didn't have consistency for taxes you can obviously th see that people might use different methods to try to manipulate when income is earned to lower the taxes so if you use the second method the credit balance in your account at the end of the tax year is business income under this method you do not reduce the cost of goods sold by the cash discount you receive so when valuing your closing inventory you cannot reduce the invoice price of merchandise on hand at the close of your tax year by the average estimated discount received on the merchandise all right trade discounts these are discounts from the list or catalog prices and are usually not written into the invoice or charged to the customer so do not enter these discounts on your books of account instead use only the net amount as the cost of the merchandise purchased so different type of discount here the cash discounts typically are because we paid cash so and then now we have a trade discount so the trade discount you would think possibly would be reflected in the cost of the merchandise that you're purchasing so you're purchasing the merchandise it has a sticker price you get a trade discount of some kind so you would think that you would be purchasing the merchandise for in essence a lower price after the discounts when you put it on our books then you would think that you would put the inventory on the books at the cost that you actually paid for it after the discount in which case when you expense it then you're going to have the cost of goods sold at that lower discounted amount which will result in a higher net income income minus cost of goods sold so do not enter these discounts on your books of account instead use only the tax amount as the cost of the merchandise purchase so for more information there you can see trade discounts in chapter six payment placed in escrow so if the buyer of your property places part or all of the purchase price in escrow you do not include any part of it in gross sales until you actually or constructively receive it so escrow is most commonly something that we see in many states with regards to real estate and you can think of it kind of like as a holding point where until the full business transaction has taken place because there's so many things that have to happen before a big sale such as a sale of real estate actually goes through so if it's in escrow then in theory you you don't actually have the money at this point in time because it's in that basically that holding account so you would think then you wouldn't have constructively received it whether using any cash or, or accrual method you would think and so it's not until you actually receive it that uh, it would be available to you at least on a cash based method and then you would be recording possibly income after it's out of escrow so however on upon completion of the terms of the contract and the escrow agreement you will have taxable income even if you do not accept the money until next year so in other words you've completed the contract of the business and now the money is basically available to you you can you can access it so you would think then again even on a cash based system if you just choose not to take it out of the escrow account into your account even though you have the capacity to do so then you have basically constructively received the income at that point in time and you'd still have to record it in in income when it's available to you so sales returns and allowances credits you allow customers for returned merchandise and any other allowances you make on sales are deductions from gross sales and figuring net sales so obviously if you sell stuff and then some something happens and they're going to return the items that were sold then you can reduce usually we see that as a reduction of sales so in other words if i was to sell something let's say i got cash for it i sold something I got cash for it I increased cash I increased revenue if they return the the thing at that point at that point in time then I'm going to say that there's a returns and allowances so you would think if they returned it you could record like an expense of having to pay back for the returned item so you would think that you can either increase the expense and then you can increase the inventory but maybe uh you don't have the inventory anymore because it's been damaged or something then you might have to write off the inventory in other words when you when you make the sale the 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 transaction that's going to happen will typically be if it was for cash you'd have cash going up 
for so this would be the journal entry when we sell stuff cash goes up sales goes up cost of goods sold the expense goes up and then the uh, inventory is going to be going down net impact on net income is going to be the sales minus the cost of goods sold if they return the merchandise then you would think you'd have to reverse this in essence meaning that often you would think that sales would have to go back down normally we don't make sales go down what do we do instead well you can think we could put an expense like a bad debt expense would be kind of like that but we usually make a, a contra sales account called sales returns and allowances so it's like a, a sales account that kind of acts like an expense that makes net income go down and then we have to we might have to actually pay the cash back if we uh, selected cash and then the inventory would be going back on the books and we'd have a basically a negative cost of goods sold and then if the inventory is no good we might have to basically you know write off uh the inventory would be the general idea so cash credits uh you allow customers to return merchandise and any other allowances you make on the sales are deductions from gross sales and figuring net sales so we're not talking about net income here we're talking about net sales which is usually net of things like returns and allowances so income minus returns and allowances gives us the net sales minus other expenses gives us the net income okay advanced payments so special rules dealing with an accrual method of accounting for payments received in advance are discussed in chapter two so in other words uh, if you choose to have the accrual method, then we're going to recognize revenue when we have earned the revenue. Usually we get paid after we do the work for most businesses or at the same time. A food truck, for example, does work. They get paid at the same time. So we recognize at the point in time the work was done and when we got paid. Or a bookkeeping business, we do the work first, usually bill the client and then get paid in the future at which point in time we would record the revenue under an accrual method when we did the work and invoiced the client. But some businesses, usually more rare types of businesses, get paid first in advance. And we saw that if we get paid in advance, then we're going to get the money first. And this would be like possibly a subscription model for newspapers. We get the money first and then we record uh the the we would record it as unearned revenue and then we would transfer it from unearned revenue to revenue when we actually earned it when we when we actually gave the newspapers we saw that the irs is going to be skeptical of these advance payments because if you get the money in advance the irs position would be well you already have the money and we would like you to record revenue at the point in time you receive the money so it depends how advanced the advanced is Again, that'll be specific to certain types of industries or possibly certain types of transactions that you can you can possibly specialize in, in some cases, uh, and do your research on those advanced payment situations. So insurance proceeds. So if you receive insurance or another type of reimbursement for a casualty or theft loss, you must subtract it from the loss when you figure your deduction. So you have a loss and then you get an insurance. So why is it here under the income section? Because you might say, well, it's income. I got, I got money from the insurance company, but obviously the money is there to generally reimburse you for the loss that you've gotten. So if you're, if you're building burnt down, you have a loss, the insurance is gonna recoup the loss. The insurance then is gonna be reducing the amount of the loss that you got from the thing burning down. Now, obviously, if you got more insurance than the value of the thing that burned down, then you might have some kind of gain situation due to some a weird situation where you have a gain so you cannot deduct the reimbursed part of the casualty or theft loss so for information on casualty and theft losses you can see publication 547 so again obviously for losses the idea is can i deduct them if you get a reimbursement from insurance you would think you can't deduct the part that you got reimbursed for because you got reimbursed for that part 